Now, lots of people who are interacting with a narcissist make rookie mistake number one. They ask the narcissist, why are you so angry? Never ask them that. Asking a narcissistic person their motivations for something, especially their anger, spins into even more rage because it activates shame. Everybody wants to know the why of narcissism. Why, why, why are they like this? Why is my parent like this? Why is my partner? Why, why, why? So in this video, we're going to unpack a big challenge that's raised when we do this whole process of understanding why someone is narcissistic. The number one question that comes up around narcissism when I speak to groups or do question answer sessions about narcissistic relationship is why, why, why Dr. Romani, why is this person like this? The why is complicated. It's a complex mix of temperament, early childhood experiences, adverse childhood experiences such as abuse and trauma, culture, parental behavior, gender, society, and there is no formula. Two people with a similar balance of these factors of temperament, early childhood, and so on could have very different personalities. There are very few absolutes in psychology. While trauma can be an explanatory factor for the development of a narcissistic personality, it is more likely trauma is more likely to be associated with downstream things that are not narcissism, like anxiety in adulthood. So by the time we get to the why and recognize that the narcissistic person in front of you may have had their personality shaped by trauma or by being spoiled by overindulgent entitled parents or by cultural practices that played into golden child gendered stuff, Ultimately, what you have in front of you is still an invalidating, entitled, dysregulated, unempathic person. That part remains the same. The way the sausage was made is different, and it is still not good for you. Ultimately, those, those patterns are not good for anyone else in a relationship with them. And I get it. If someone is just being so awful to you all the time, you want to understand the why of it. Somehow understand the motivation behind it. Maybe people think understanding that will help it make more sense. Now, the other side of this issue is one of the core elements of the narcissistic personality, the insecurity. The grandiosity, arrogance, entitlement, lack of empathy, validation seeking, it's all a suit of armor, a set of defenses unconsciously deployed to manage a cauldron of anxiety and shame that is lurking all the time for a person with a narcissistic personality. Whether it's a big public personality who's behaving badly or the person sitting right next to us, we can clearly see how insecurity is operating for them. Hell, you even kind of sometimes feel bad for them. They don't have the tools to be able to make the self-effacing comments, to be safe while being vulnerable, to just be human and be ordinary. But it is hard, no matter how insecure they are, to feel bad for someone who is always manipulating and mocking you. But the very insecurity, that, but the insecurity at the very least can definitely pull for pity. And so you find yourself going between pity, anger, and hurt all the time. So all of this gets mashed up. The possibility of traumatic or other bleak childhood backstories, the insecurity, you may feel bad for them. And this applies whether it is your parent, your partner, friend, family, colleague, you feel bad. And that's your empathy talking, and that's fine. However, here is where the car goes off the cliff. Many survivors will say, I don't have the right to feel so mad at them. I don't have the right to be upset if they did have such a bad childhood or they're from a different culture or they don't have that much money or they're insecure. They're just having a bad time of it. They have a tough life. I have no right to feel bad at them. Nope, not true and you lost me there. You have the right 
to feel whatever you want, including mad, disgusted, sad, upset. Their behavior is hurtful and it's hurting you. It doesn't matter their backstory. You can certainly have empathy for the backstory and even be able to see it clearly and understand where their insecurity and the subsequent behavior comes from. Keep that empathy. It's good for you and it's good for everyone else. But empathy doesn't mean that you deny yourself. That we call abnegation. We call it self-flagellation. We call it self-denial. Don't confuse empathy with those things. But sadly, the message from society all too often is, oh, someone's going through something which is code with, oh, so put up with it. Nah, no more. Too many people are putting up with other stu people's stuff and nobody's supporting these people that are putting up with everything. I keep bringing up this concept of multiple truths because we live in a world where everyone wants stuff to be black or white, good or bad, one way only. Apparently critical thinking went the way of the Blackberry one day and no one does it anymore. The multiple truths are the narcissistic person is behaving really badly. They had a tough life. They're really insecure. They hurt you. You are angry. That can all coexist. The silencing of people who are harmed by antagonistic people, whether that is a self-silencing or a silencing by others, is simply not okay and really does harm to them. Everybody has a right to be hurt. And it also means, though, that you don't need to get in the mud and go eye for eye on them and treat them as badly as they treat you. It's just not good for you. You can slowly disengage. They will never be clear on what their motivations for what they do are but at least you can be a little more clear. Silencing your own feelings, telling yourself you don't have the right to feel what you feel, doing that distances you from yourself. It harms you and sometimes can be associated with other maladaptive ways of coping that are designed to numb you, like drinking alcohol, using drugs, shopping, spending, eating. Feel. It's important to feel. Lots of people have tough backstories and they're really lovely people. The tendency of the narcissistic person to be a victim when it's convenient for them and gets them validation and gets them out of trouble, that plays on the empathy of the folks around them who can often feel silenced by those backstories. Please, always retain your empathy. Feel bad for them if you need, or if you want, or that's how it feels. Feel pity for them. And simultaneously also allow yourself to feel what you feel. That is your right. I tell you that is the most complicated balancing act in the world, though, to feel the pity and the guilt about their backstory, then at the same time to feel hurt. Those two things, that's that cognitive dissonance. And so their backstory often becomes a justification. You're hurt in the face of their bad behavior, which may even be in part be explained by their backstory, is still hurt. Remember that. Because the more you deny that, the more that you slowly, again, disengage from your true sense of self. And that can really take a, will take a toll on you in the long term. Do narcissistic people know that they are narcissistic? And all of you know, I've always said, don't call them out, right? But what if they know? And so what if you call them out, right? So, you know, well, my question also here is, does it really matter? And I recognize for a lot of you, it's like, yeah, Dr. Romney, it does matter. It does matter to us. Because I have to say, though, the answer to this question is more complicated. And the answer to it actually does affect the experience of people going through narcissistic abuse. But what people want to know, actually, it goes deeper than that. It's not just do they know they're narcissistic. You're actually asking a bigger question is, do they have any insight into themselves? So let's break this down from the perspective of insight. And then what kind of insight group your narcissistic people are in, how that affects you. Let's talk about group number one. Group number one are actually the narcissistic folks who know they are narcissistic and they don't give a damn. In fact, they're kind of proud of it. They'll be like, yeah, I speak my mind and I don't care what other people think. And if that makes me a narcissist, I don't care. So nah, I don't care what you feel. Get over yourself. These are typically grandiose and malignant narcissistic folks. Sometimes they are stubborn, self-righteous narcissistic folks who are obsessively wedded to their judgmental and rigid view of the world. 
I got to tell you, though, if you're in a relationship with someone like this who knows they are and have no likelihood to change, you're kind of sunk. Remember that we live in a world where narcissism is incentivized and it's rewarded. It could be that because narcissistic people do make m money. It may be because someone, they have power. It may even simply be that the narcissistic person is broke and they failed at everything they've tried, but they simply want to dominate the people in their lives through threats and yelling and domination. Those are the things that matter to them. But when it comes down to it, right, they don't have empathy, they're egocentric, and they really don't care what other people think when it comes to feelings. So you calling them narcissistic in this group doesn't really impact them that much. These are the people in this group of narcissists are often quite surprised and angry when they're called out in a way that impacts them. So for example, they lose their job or they get publicly shamed or they get arrested. But even then, right until the end, they will blame other people or call it a witch hunt. Narcissistic folks at the top of their game tend to be found in this group because they are getting away with it and they get emboldened by that fact, right? If you are in any kind of relationship with one of these group one narcissists, the ones who know they are like this and they don't care, forget about it. If you can get out safely, then get out. If you can't, radical acceptance. But overall, remember that this is the group that is least likely to ever change. There is no investment in change by them or caring about hurting other people. They are actually fully leaned into their egocentric, unempathic, unkind, dominating, entitled, and inappropriate personas. This is a group you never really should call out. Now, to break the cognitive dissonance with these group one narcissists, basically you're going to have to tell yourself, this relationship I have, I don't know, with your partner, parent, friend, sibling, boss, whoever it is, I am in a relationship with a world-class ass and there's nothing that will change that. And I am staying in this relationship because I'll fill in the blank, whatever your reasons are, and I know they won't change. Done. Now, group two is an interesting group because this is the group of folks that know that they are narcissistic and they want to change it and they are a little bit ashamed. This is a group that raises the biggest issues with cognitive dissonance for the people around them. Because once folks in this group start seeing what their behavior is doing to other people or to their professional life, or they finally connect the dots, after their initial shame, rage, meltdown, they often get exhausted and do recognize that they need to do something about it. They may go into therapy or rehab or both, these are folks who are sometimes defeated grandiose narcissists, who are vulnerable narcissists, and sometimes communal narcissists who actually do care about how they look to the world and what they want to do in the world. There are a few ways that folks in this group learn that their behavior is not okay. Maybe they hear it from someone they trust. They may not even be told that they are narcissistic, but rather they were told that their behavior is abusive or cruel or entitled. And that can often result in some kind of loss or shame. They lose a relationship or a job. But they're able to hear it eh, a little bit defensively, but they can still hear it. They have enough insight that they think, oh, that's not so good. That is not a good look. They may feel ashamed whenever they slip and rage and they will quickly try to gather themselves. Now, it's tough if you're in a relationship with someone like this because it becomes a difficult cycle. They get it. They may even apologize. They may even try, but the probability of them slipping back into the old patterns, especially if they're disappointed or frustrated or stressed, is still pretty high unless they are in some really, really good therapy. For some of you, just to see that they are trying and do sometimes seem to apologize, that may be enough. For some of you, the cycle may be exhausting because of all of the back and forth, the good behavior, the bad behavior. You go back and forth between rationalizing the relationship and wanting to leave it, especially if there are stakes in the relationship, children, family, a home, a job you can't leave. Their awareness that they are behaving badly may be enough for you to try the, and find the workarounds because you see them trying a little. 
this group can sometimes be prone to rage because they're often getting exhausted from trying hard and they don't always get it right, which can often set off the shame and rage cycle, like a frustrated child who throws their puzzle that they can't figure out across the room. Now, this is a group of narcissistic folks where if you do call them out, you may set off the shame rage cycle, but also you may sometimes get a grudging, yeah, you're right, I got it, that's not cool, I'm sorry about that. Now, staying or going here is intensely personal, and if ever the unicorns who change were in a group, it's this group, of knowing that they are narcissistic and wanting to do something about it, but finding it hard. Now, the group three folks are the people who actually don't get it and get angry because people have had it with them. They literally don't get why people have a problem with them. And it's almost as though they don't understand why people are, are troubled by their behavior or just don't let them get away with anything they're doing. They are almost as bad as the folks in group one, but I would argue they're a little worse because the folks in group one are copying to their narcissism. This group doesn't get it. They simply don't understand that they do not have empathy or that they are dysregulated and scary or that they are entitled. They just don't. Now, these do tend to be malignant narcissists, self-righteous narcissists, sometimes grandiose and vulnerable narcissists can be found here as well. These are people who completely lack self-awareness, lack insight, and have no capacity to be self-reflective. They are contemptuous and dismissive and will often tell you that you're being an idiot, asking too much. They will gaslight and tell you that you're emotional. There is a thin-skinned, constantly provoked, almost paranoid feel. Group three actually looks almost a little bit closer to sociopathy. And any emotional or normal relationship ask not only will not be met, it will be pushed back on angrily. In addition, the, these folks who just don't get it and get angry, they get angry because people are holding them to a behavioral standard that doesn't even make sense to them or that they feel that them having to talk about feelings slows them down and they resent being held to the normal rules of social functioning. Now, people in this group will be very oppositional if they are ever asked to do anything as well. They don't want to do anything. They, in some ways, they feel like spoiled teenagers. Now, this is a group where we see more severe narcissistic abuse for the people who are in the relationships with these folks because there really is no hope for change here. And sometimes there may even be a risk for more dangerous aggression or violence to ramp up. These folks will not get into therapy unless they're forced to. But since there's no insight or motivation to change, any therapy, even forced therapy, is not going to work. These are unhealthy and psychologically unsafe relationships. There is virtually no hope for change. I always acknowledge that some people can't leave these relationships, whatever their reasons are. So if you're going to stay, it's radical acceptance all day or an all night and realistic expectations. It's essential to have support, be in therapy, and have a safety plan. Now, the narcissistic folks in group four are similar to group three but they don't get angry. There's just no emotion there. They actually don't get that. They're, they don't understand why people don't like their behavior full stop. Sometimes they get a little angry, but there's a lot of like, what did I do? What, what, what? Why is everyone mad at me? I actually know someone like this and yeah, sometimes they're angry, but usually it's, huh? I don't understand what the problem is people have with me. In this case, there may even be overlaps with some social processing deficits because they really, really don't get it. But we also see alongside that a lack of insight, a lack of empathy, the grandiosity, the entitlement, the arrogance, just wanting things the way they want them. They, all of that's there. So they don't get it. And while they aren't as visibly scary as group three, who always gets angry, the folks in this group are also continually behaving in emotionally abusive ways just through their lack of insight and their neglect of relationships. And they just don't care, nor do they get it. In this group, we really do see the neglectful narcissists, vulnerable narcissists, and sometimes the self-righteous narcissists, and every so often the malignant ones. Although, like I said, the malignant narcissistic folks are more often in group three since they're more ragey. But these folks just don't get it, and they basically seem emotionally clueless. Their cluelessness can create confusion and justification by the people around them because people may give them a free pass by saying, they really don't understand what they're doing wrong. They really don't. But the other side of that is that they are still quite antagonistic, manipulative, callous, hostile, grandiose, validation-seeking. 
if it was just not the understanding of emotion or their impact on others or the, exp or the experience other people are having, and we did not see the antagonistic patterns, we might even consider social processing deficits or even full-blown autism spectrum. But the presence of the antagonistic stuff we see in this group negates that as a possibility. Now, a relationship with someone like this is like living in an emotional famine. There is no mirroring, no awareness. You could be crying and they might just walk away from you. You could be begging on your hands and knees to be heard and they may just shrug their shoulders. And if you gave them feedback about their coldness or their lack of empathy, they may say, I, I, I don't get it. I have plenty of empathy. What are you so upset about? To say that these relationships are confusing is an understatement. And also, this is a group that will never get into therapy, nor is there much likelihood of change, even if they did. So couples therapy, if you're someone like this, is an utter waste of time. Because there's little awareness. They have no awareness of what they are doing, nor do they care about who they're affecting by what they're doing or not doing. And even again, if they were forced or mandated into therapy, it's just not going to be likely to work. This pattern's not likely to change. People sometimes wonder why these folks, people in this group four, who just they have no understanding of how they affect people, why would they even get into a relationship? Because they're so disconnected. But they still need validation and supply, and that's why they need other people around them, as well as needing people to do stuff for them that they feel entitled to. Now, obviously, there is really no likelihood of a healthy or a thriving relationship here. The relative absence of the rage that we see here may mean that those who can't leave in a, a relationship like this with someone like this can adjust to the famine conditions and will need therapy and supports to get through this. You may be able to stay if you build a network of friends, interests, work, and recognize that there is basically just sort of a strange roommate that is in your house or in your life. The radical acceptance becomes essential as and it also becomes essential that you don't personalize it because there's simply a lack of self-awareness here that represents a real social deficit and it's, it's not you. So some narcissistic folks do know that they are narcissistic and may even cop to it. Other folks have no clue and are not likely to get a clue anytime soon. The origins of the, the narcissism can have a lot to do with this. People who grow up really sort of spoiled and overindulge and privilege, they may be in those first group of people, the ones who know that they're narcissistic and just don't care. The ones who, the folks who experience more of the attachment traumas and early life deprivation, they may be the ones who just simply don't get what, like why people have a problem with them, the groups three and four. Ultimately, narcissism is a rather nuanced pattern. It's a personality style that almost never works in a relationship. But the different presentations mean that you may be struggling in these relationships in different ways. So that was a very long answer to do they know they're narcissistic? Some do, some don't. And that difference can really make these relationships feel quite different. So here's a question that's come up a few times that people have brought, brought to me. Does a narcissist know that they are future faking? Or do they believe that they can change or deliver on these future faked promises? Drop your answers in the chat. I'd love to read those. Because future faking is the worst. Because it's an almost impossible thing to work around. If you are in a narcissistic relationship and you are future faked, there is no way to call it out in the moment if you are still justifying and stuck. If the thing that is being future faked, things like, when I get the promotion, we will move, and I'll be home more, or I'm going to get into therapy and do this or that. The fact is, it takes a minute for those things to happen. So frankly, the only people who often feel able to take a stand against future faking are those who have been so repeatedly future faked that one day they have enough evidence to say, you promised this 10 times, well, the narcissist says, no, 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 this time's different. And hopefully the person has afforded you to say, not after 10 times do I believe you. But that means that the person has wasted years, maybe even decades, to gather the evidence that the future faking was indeed fake. Now, in case you don't know what it is, 
Future faking is keeping someone in a relationship on the basis of a promise to change or that the thing the person wants will happen in a certain number of months. Most future fakes are for things that will happen within six months. Some can be longer term, like telling someone I want children, but I'm going to want them after I get a certain amount of stability and make a certain amount of money. And when they actually get to that point, they don't actually want kids. And by the time you figure it out, it may be a little bit too late in the game for you to get out and feel that you might be able to find someone else to have children with. So it really can be quite awful. Years can get wasted on future faking. And like I said, many times people don't call it out. So for example, if a person says, yep, I'm going to get therapy and I'm going to change, you can't say, do it now, change this instant. You have to wait for them to make the call and see the therapist and on and on. That takes a minute. And if enough stuff of life is happening or distraction while this promised therapy is launching, if it ever launches, you may even forget that promise and then the problem's going to come up again and you're right back where you started. So the question, though, that was brought to me is whether they know, the narcissistic person knows their future faking. Is it deliberate? With narcissistic folks, the only thing that is consistently deliberate is them doing something to get what they want or need now and do what works for them. So they'll make promises, tell lies, whatever they need to do to get what they want or need now. If they need to stay in a relationship with you, then they are going to make a promise around what you are asking for to keep you around. That's the short term play. And once and once that gets settled, they figure that the rest of it will work out. Narcissistic and psychopathic individuals are not only impulsive, they don't always think about consequences clearly. Narcissistic people don't care about other people, so they don't think about what more waiting or letting a person down again will do to that person. All they know is that they told you that they would do what you asked down the road so you don't leave them or get mad at them or take away validation from them. They are arrogant and grandiose enough to believe that it will all work out and unempathic enough to not care how it will affect you. They don't think they need to change. Now, that's not all narcissists. I am guessing that about 10% of people, and that's a ballpark, maybe it's generous actually, with narcissistic personalities, may recognize that they need to change, that their lives are a mess, that they've burned lots of bridges, and they may actually not want to hurt people anymore. They've sort of hit that rarest of rock bottoms, the blessed unicorns. It doesn't mean that they can, but those folks may be able to make some small, potentially sustainable changes maybe enough to relieve some of the pressure, but frankly, when the stress levels are up again and the disappointment returns, there's a pretty strong likelihood that the antagonistic behavior will, will return. All of that said, the narcissistic person, when they are future faking, they aren't thinking of changing. They are thinking about what they need to do at that moment to get what they want. Whether that is taking money from you that they say they'll pay back, borrowing your car that they say they'll have back in time for you to go to work or something, that it's time, they, time served in therapy so that you don't leave them. Whatever they want right then, that's what they're focused on. They aren't thinking about whether they can change or be better, nor are they thinking about their behavior as manipulative future faking. They are thinking about what they want now and how to get it, regardless of what the cost is going to be for you. It's hard to change when we don't think change is necessary. It's hard to change when we think it is. It's almost impossible when we don't. And this is compounded by the inconsistent empathy that we see in narcissism. People with empathy may still find it hard, for example, to keep their socks picked up off the floor or do the dishes, but they may do it because they know it matters to another person. That isn't the same motivator for narcissistic folks. They don't care about the other person. So future faking is a quick fix for them. And they aren't even connecting it to having to make real changes or delivering on their future promises. They're doing it to get something done now. I hope that makes sense. And um, yeah, 
I was about to say something, but I recognize it wasn't going to be right. So, yeah. So that that's the, I hope that answers that question because a lot of people have brought it to me. And um, and then reflect on your own future faking in your relationship because I got to tell you, it's one of the real central dynamics of these relationships. One that can really cause a lot of people to waste a lot of time. Do narcissists know that they hurt you? Now, this is a question that I get from so many people. I get it from emails, I get it from clients, I get it in group sessions I do. So what will happen for a person is a narcissistic person hurts them. But what the person who's been hurt wants to know, do they know, does this narcissistic person know that they hurt me? Now, I guess the first thing I often want to know is like, what is your motivation for wanting to know this, okay? So, one of the things that might be driving you is wanting to know, is the narcissist doing this intentionally? Are they actually sitting down with the intention of hurting me? Or, number two, is the narcissist so clueless that they have no idea that they're hurting me? And here's what's interesting. The answer is actually a little of both. In a subset of cases, yeah, they set out to hurt you. And that is often quite punitive. So when you might see a narcissist intentionally setting out to hurt someone is, for example, when they're on the defensive. They might want to lash out at you for some sort of perceived slight or for your feedback or a critique you gave them or because you didn't compliment them the right way. At those times when they feel slighted in some ways, now that can come out either through a passive aggressive barb or directly they do set out to hurt you. And more than anything, it is punitive. It's a way, in a way, in a way they're trying to make you feel as bad as they just felt a minute ago, but they're not in touch with that. It sort of sets the scales right for them, and it almost gives them that sense of justice that they always feel like they desperately need. It almost like they feel better now that they've done something to you so that you feel bad because they're already feeling bad. But I gotta tell you, in more cases, Narcissists are just really careless. They say what they want, they do what they want, they have very little care, very little regard for how their words or their actions will impact you. I'm gonna be telling you, they just don't care. And there are a few ingredients that sort of come together here to help you understand that. First, and always, is their lack of empathy they just don't take into account the feelings of other people. And they also have very little self-reflective capacity. They don't stop to think about how their behavior or their words might impact somebody else. The second thing to pay attention to is their impulsivity. And they will often use their impulsivity as an excuse. They'll use it as an excuse when they want something or they want to say something or they want to do something. They just do it or they say it. They don't think, they just do or say or take what they want. Now, as you can imagine, their impulsivity can often get them into a bit of trouble and it can be very painful. Their impulsivity can mean that they say things are, that are hurtful, they engage in dismissive insults, they may lie, you might see infidelity, physical acting out, including violence driving very erratically, spending money that they don't have, expressing rage. But as a rule, narcissists act first and ask for apologies later. And sadly, because most people give them absolution, let them off the hook, they keep behaving badly. It's one of the key ways the world enables them. They let them get away with all their impulsivity. Now the third piece, is their entitlement. Remember, they don't believe the rules apply to them, and they're actually very hypocritical. They hold other people's feet to the fire about the rules. They just don't follow the rules themselves. So as a result, what it might mean is that you might make a passing comment that they don't like, and that they feel that when you say that, it's completely unacceptable. But if they make the same error, if they say something 
that they feel that they they know wasn't right, then they'll say, oh, I'm just a human being. Sometimes I make mistakes. Entitlement means no rules for them, but the right for them to do as they want. And that can be angering. Now, fourth is their arrogance and their contempt. Their arrogance that somehow they are above all of the demands of intimacy in a human relationship. And their contempt for the sensitive and the emotional parts of human relationships. What's interesting about narcissists, these, you know, again, they've been called the disagreeable extroverts. They like human relationships to the degree that they're able to get narcissistic supply and validation and the conveniences that other people bring to their life or the profit or the sex or other things that they want or need. But they really don't like the messy business of having to deal, actually deal with people and their emotional worlds. So now, when we break it down into all these sort of subcomponents of narcissism, you can see how all of this together means that they may not set out to hurt you. They just don't care enough to think about whether their behavior actually will hurt you. And after they do hurt you, they don't really care that they did hurt you. And all of that can really leave you feeling a bit confused. If they didn't mean to hurt you, then maybe it isn't that big a deal. That's something for you to consider. Now, certainly, if you are in a relationship with someone who intentionally sets out to hurt you, that is something that starts careening into more of a sadistic realm, that somebody actually gets off on harming you. It's easier to get your head around the idea that someone intentionally hurting you is a bad thing and even get your head around the idea that maybe you need to get out of this relationship. And sadly, even when you know that they may be intentionally trying to hurt you, you may still stay in the relationship and that's a different conversation. But it is a little easier to say, okay, they're intentionally hurting me. This is not okay. I may need to get out. However, because so often in narcissistic relationships, the reason they do hurtful things is really their carelessness and their impulsivity. The more, that is the more likely backstory of their hurtful behavior. Does that change things for you? Does it really matter to you if it is intentional? Listen, give you a stupid example. If someone hand slips, I don't know, they're doing something and they end up slapping you across the face really hard just because they slipped. Now, obviously, you may interpret it differently if it was an accident, but that slap hurts. And if they keep making that slip and keep slapping you across the face and it's always ex accidental, I wonder how long you're going to put up with that. And I wonder how long you're going to be willing to say, yeah, this isn't okay. In relationships, yes, people make mistakes all the time. In our relationships, we say things that could be hurtful and that are hurtful. And in healthy relationships, you catch it. You catch yourself when you do or say those things and you take responsibility and you apologize genuinely and hope that the other person accepts it. And most, most importantly, you don't repeat that hurtful behavior. Now, with a person who's narcissistic, even if, and that's a big if, that they catch their behavior, they probably won't. Uh, in fact, the only way they may understand that they behaved badly is because you or someone else said something like, oh, I'm sorry, is that a problem? If they don't see it, if they don't identify it yourself, th I'm sorry, themselves, then it is a very low likelihood that they're going to apologize. They're more likely to either A, blame you for their behavior, B, blame someone else or some other situation in their life for their behavior, oh, I'm working so hard, defend or rationalize their behavior, or gaslight you and tell you that you are overreacting or being too sensitive. Or, even better yet, they may do a combination of all of these things. So even if you make the courageous step 
of calling their behavior out as hurtful. Not only are they not likely to take responsibility for it, they are also extremely unlikely to apologize for it and completely unlikely to change it. So let's go back to the original question. Do they know they hurt you? Maybe. Sometimes they may see the expression on your face. Their insecure core doesn't want to take responsibility. And because they don't want to view themselves as the person who does hurty things, their more likely response is gaslighting or deflection. Taking responsibility for bad behavior is overwhelming and it can result in shame for them. Now, so this, this next part is going to be of little solace to you. I'm going to, as a, on a probability basis, I'm going to tell you now, they probably do know they hurt you. But they don't like how that makes them feel, so they don't own it, and they don't address it. And this is what I mean when I say narcissists rarely change. It doesn't matter if they think they have changed, if it doesn't translate into behavioral change. Then no, they didn't. If someone's like, no, I see, I, do, I see that I do these things that hurt you, but then they keep doing them, that's not changing. And because of their deeply ingrained lack of empathy and entitlement and arrogance and contempt and impulsivity, the odds of change in them are pretty close to zero. So you may wonder what would happen if you explain to them very clearly that they hurt you or, they hurt, or, or that maybe even that someone else explains to them that they hurt you. They just don't care. And as I said, plan on a gaslight deflection, rationalization, invalidation response from them. So in that way, you just get more hurt on top of the original hurt. When it comes down to brass tacks, yeah, they might know they hurt you. Yeah, they may see the hurt in your face, but they will almost never take responsibility. They may, as narcissists do, issue an empty apology, but even that may not be very likely. And I can promise you this, they are very unlikely to change that behavior, so you can plan on it happening again. And what's painful is that means you're forever on this carousel with narcissists, carelessly or intentionally hurting you over and over again. So whether they know they hurt you or not, it's not going to stop. And based on that, it really is on your shoulders. It's your responsibility to make the choice that is best for you. Does it matter if they know they hurt you or not if they keep doing it? It's a bit of a philosophical question. And some people say, well, if they didn't mean to hurt me, then is it that bad? So the question I really am going to put to you then is, maybe they didn't mean to hurt you. But once they find out they hurt, they hurt you, they don't care they hurt you. What are you going to do with that? It's often difficult to infer other people's motivations. And especially in the case of narcissism, they're often not very transparent about their intentions and motivations because they themselves aren't actually in touch with them. They're very willing to make assumptions about other people's motivations and assume oftentimes you are insulting them, letting them down, making fun of them or whatever. But it's always a risky game we play when we do it. So whether or not they intended to or not probably matters less than the fact that they did and that after they do, their unwillingness to care about it or take responsibility, that's the point that you need to think about it from. Do narcissists know why they are so angry because goodness knows they are this is a question that comes up quite a bit many people have asked me you know the drill a narcissistic person goes into a rageful state they start yelling screaming tantruming it's often a big mess and if you are in the crosshairs of this rage you are often left rattled or shattered. And so often are the other people around you. And afterwards, sometimes the narcissist will make excuses. Oh, 
whatever. I couldn't help it. Or, I know, I know. All right, I was loud, but I didn't mean it. Stop overreacting, okay? I didn't mean those things I said. You know what I meant. Or why can't you see your part in this? Oh, enough. Everyone's being too sensitive about this, okay? I said, all right, I'm sorry. Or let it go. It's done. It's good. Like, I was just going through some stuff. Just let it go. So they've had their tantrum, and we need to let it go, right? So some of these excuses might even work if it only happened one time. But this rage is repeated. And that is the cycle with the narcissist. Tension building, rage, destruction, and then pathetic, weak apologies, maybe a little bit of shame. So the big question is, do they even know why they're so angry and ragey? Probably not, because here's the deal. In Dr. Romani's fantasy world, let's imagine they could actually articulate the full answer and reason for why they are so angry. Because then they might say something like, well, I'm angry and ragey because I'm deeply insecure and I feel my life or this situation I'm in is deeply unfair and that I'm entitled to something better than what is happening now because I am important, but that is not happening, so I resent it and I don't understand why people can't just act the way that I want and do what I want and anticipate my needs. So when you say things to me that don't fit that or you ask me to do something that I don't want to do, it's just too much for me. And my shame and my sense of injustice and my entitlement just can't bear it. So I just need to be able to let it out and I should be able to say or do whatever I want without any consequences. Now, you and I both know they are not gonna say that. And yet, right there, that is what's underlying their anger and rage and they can't put that in words because it sounds ridiculous. Because even a three-year-old's tantrum is more sophisticated. Because a three-year-old will tantrum because they're tired or hungry and they don't have the capability of preparing their own food. Or because they're just deeply frustrated. Because a three-year-old isn't able to do everything they want and they're not in control of their own lives. They can't even turn on the TV. I can get down with that. I have told my two children when they were respectively each three-year-olds many times while they melted down that the reaction's unacceptable, but I can feel the pain. And not so much with a narcissist who's not three. And since a narcissistic adult is not able to give that long rationale I gave you for what they're experiencing, people who are in relationships with narcissistic people are left holding the bag and wondering, what the hell was that? Now, lots of people who are interacting with a narcissist make rookie mistake number one. They ask the narcissist, why are you so angry? Never ask them that. Asking a narcissistic person their motivations for something, especially their anger, spins into even more rage because it activates shame. Their reason for their angry outbursts is too vulnerable for them to even be in touch with, let alone share, and it's too insecure for them to articulate it. They don't like what it implies about them. They like to think of themselves as a superhero. So for them, shame, you got to remember for all of us, actually, shame is like a vampire. If it sees sunlight, it dies, which is what I think happens to right vamp vampires, right? So we start to divulge. If we start to divulge our shame sources, the shame sources lose power. Now, it's too destabilizing for a narcissist to do this, to put their shame out in the sunlight. So they keep working out their shame through rage on your time. A common presentation with narcissistic people is that they carry this sullen, brooding, petulant anger with them all the time. In general, narcissistic people are just basically malcontents, never happy. Even the most charismatic, grandiose, charming narcissistic people tend to be malcontents. They are charismatic and charming until things stop going their way. Their anger is about their entitlement not being realized, about someone having more than them, about that chronic squirrely discomfort that a narcissistic person lives with. Anyone who ever grew up with a narcissistic parent knows it well. It's like living with a powder keg. Yesterday, I was actually, I was doing some research about something else and then I came across this line from Gillian Flynn's book, Gone Girl 
Some of you may have read it. I had never read someone capture an angry narcissistic dad captured so well. Here's her passage. She writes, he never beat her, but his pure inarticulate fury would fill the house for days, weeks at a time, making the air humid, hard to breathe. My father stalking around with his lower jaw jutting out, giving him the look of a wounded, vengeful boxer, grinding his teeth so loud you could hear it across the room. I'm sure he told himself, I never hit her. I'm sure because of this technicality, he never saw himself as an abuser. But he turned our family life into an endless road trip with bad directions and a rage and a rage clenched driver, a vacation that never got a chance to be fun. I think that quote captures it so beautifully. Now, because narcissists are not in touch with or don't want to be in touch with why they are so angry, this cycle of anger keeps repeating. Now, if a healthy person knows what makes them angry, they may try to address it and they may also apologize for it, or at the very best, be mindful and recognize that they can find more appropriate outlets for their angry emotion. Now, narcissistic people are not going to get in touch with their sources of their anger on your time. Maybe if they find a really good therapist, they may get it there. But the fact is, the, when a narcissist gets in touch with their anger, it's not likely to translate to the pressures of the real world. And basically, the revolving door will be that they keep throwing their tantrums in real life and then use therapy as a confessional where they talk about the tantrum, dissect it, realize it was wrong, and then go back into the world and do it again. So it's really just the, the cycle never ends. So the short answer is no, they don't know why they are so angry. At least they're not able to get in touch with it. In fact, narcissistic people are not in touch with what motivates most of their behavior because it's just not cool to admit to being superficial and vain and insecure and entitled and believing that you are more special than everyone else and that you need tons of admiration and validation to get through the day. Even the narcissist who has almost no insight knows that it is not okay to say those things. The key is to stop engaging the narcissist in conversations about their anger. They are never going to get it and you are not going to be the one to teach them. If you are going to stay in this relationship or have to stay in this relationship, radical acceptance is about what you got. This is it. What you see is what you get. If you are going to leave, there will be rage at the point of departure and likely for some time afterwards, especially if it is a co-parenting or family situation. But at least you aren't in it and aren't trying to figure it out. Abandonment, by the way, is a major anger trigger for them. Knowing the why of our behavior is how we can address, shape, and change it in some ways. And since getting to the core of the why is just not possible with people who are narcissistic, it's just one more reason that contributes to the fact that they really don't change and likely never will, at least not substantially. And that is enough to get you angry. So please, if you only take one thing away from this video, it's simply to never say to them, why are you angry? It is just not worth it and they will never, ever be able to give you an answer that is at all straightforward or brings any kind of clarity or solace. So thanks again.